Good evening. Top on the government legislative agenda is scrapping bail for capital offenders and reforming the land laws. But those familiar with President Museveni attest to his consistency in the last 10 years in drumming up support for the intended amendments. But why has he continuously faced resistance, even within his political party, to the extent that these amendments have not seen the light of day a decade later? Tonight, we host the Deputy Attorney General, the Honorable Jackson Kafuzi. Mr. Deputy Attorney General, Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, thank you so much for having honored our invitation. A warm welcome to you. Thank you. Uganda tonight is watching and listening to you. And as a Deputy Attorney General, I want to ask, the President has come out with a proposition mm -hmm. that seemed to have not only angered those in the opposition, but also seems not to be going well within his own, own political party. Mm -hmm. And the issue is jail without bail. Why is he making this proposition? Uh, Patrick, uh, good evening to our viewers. Um, every time a law is proposed, there is what we call a mischief or a problem that it is intended to solve. To cure. To cure. Uh, for this particular case, we would want to take a multi-pronged approach. One, the judiciary has been understaffed for a while. You, because we have fewer judges handling a bigger number of cases, so many people spend longer on remand, and uh, as a result, whoever applies for bail has a higher chance of getting it. And that does not exclude those who are actually criminally liable. What do you mean those who are criminally liable? Because in this country, there's something they call the presumption of innocence. Exactly. So how do you even talk about criminal liable when somebody is still a suspect? Our intention, or the, in the intention of the proposal, is not to erode the presumption of innocence. Is not to interfere with the exercise of discretion. But this is exactly what it is going to do. But because rather, if you say jail without bail, then you mean the person is guilty. In fact, you are changing the presumption of innocence to the presumption of guilty. You know, if you look at the law, bail is not a right. If you look at the Constitution, bail is not a right. It is applying for bail that is a right. You understand? Yes. Every person charged with a criminal offense has a right to apply, to apply for, for bail. bail. Yeah. Now, because of that, uh, considering the fact that uh, the judiciary is understaffed, the judges have been using that to clear out. Okay, because so bail is the granted. So when is understaffed, those mm. who are working, you want to presume that whoever is coming before you is guilty. No, what we are because doing right now, understaffed? Patrick, what we are doing right now is uh, uh, we've had engagement with the judiciary and the executive. Uh, the budget of the judiciary has been substantially uh, increased. increased, and uh, we are embarking on recruitment trying to have enough numbers so that we can deal with this backlog, so that people do not have to take longer on remand. So if someone will not take longer on remand, then it may not ne be necessary for that person to be granted bail unless there are exceptional circumstances. You get my Isn't point. Isn't it possible for that example, when somebody is being arrested right from the police, mm. they, they, have, they should be having the capacity to investigate, mm. to look for evidence, so that by the time somebody is taken to court, you have sufficient evidence to pin this person so that he can be sentenced if the means to be sentenced. You see, what you're saying is right. But uh, our, our, our criminal legal system 
is such that while the police does investigation, the DPP does the prosecution. So you, the judicial officer, simply have to wait and see what evidence is presented to you. You understand? If the police is fast enough in preparing the file, the matter will come before court. But also, if they we take longer and say we are still Kafuzi, investigating, Kafuzi, it is also true mm -hmm. that judicial officers in cases sometimes do not grant bail even when you have applied for it. Yes. So if you know they have the powers to look at the individual f the, according to the, the facts that they have, yeah, mm. according to the facts that they have, mm. why don't you leave that in their power? Incidentally, going by our criminal judicial system, by the time the judge grants or denies you bail, he does not have the facts, all the facts of the case, okay? Unless that application is brought in the process or in the middle of the trial itself. But during remand, at any time upon arrest, anyone can apply for bail once that person has been charged with a criminal offense. Now, that means prosecution has not presented evidence and the judge or the judicial officer in charge does not know the contents, save for what is written in, on, the, on the charge sheet that you are charged with the murder, which is believed to have taken place in such and such a, a place on such and such a day. You understand? The nitty gritties of the evidence are unknown to the judge. So it depends on how you package your application. That's why we talk of exceptional circumstances. The judge is supposed to look at you and use his discretion if you are of advanced age. If there is a, a letter or a certificate, a medical certificate from the prison's officer, a medical officer indicating that w this person has an ailment that we are incapable of handling while in prison, you understand? So the judge is supposed to use his discretion. But I want you to know so that the judge is also human. If he knows that in one week he has remanded 1,000 people, and because the judicial system, I mean, the process is so congested, and this part like let's take three, four years without trial because of the fewer numbers of the judges, then whoever applies for bail, the most then, likely is then, likely then to for succeed. you for, for you then to the problem mm. is the judiciary being understaffed the problem is handling. the backlog of the cases that we have that then, we then you should now. look for a medicine the for that then, then there should be recruitment That's they should what be we staffed. Are doing right now. they should be having all the tools at their disposal in, instead of bringing something Patrick. that may at the end of the day even but you, with all respect, Honorable Kafu, you could fall victim to the same. Yes, it is open for everybody. So why, why don't you ensure that the judiciary has the tools on their disposal, you have this, they are well staffed, so that they can do the job? You see, that one is the, not an end in itself. The DPP, Office of the DPP, let, let, is well staffed, and they have what they need that, instead of taking away people's rights, and if anything, you know, incarcerating an innocent man or woman. Patrick, one, I, I want to repeat that bail is not a right. Application, Application for, for the bail, bail is a right. right. But if so you say, is, what, what, but if you say jail without what bail, is then they will not even apply. What has been perceived in the public is that you are taking away bail. No. Already the Constitution says if you are charged with a criminal f or a capital offense, you cannot be granted bail released on bail until after you have served at least 180 days, which is six, six months, you understand? So it is not an automatic right. So what we are trying to say is that let us look at the law, look at the circumstances. Yes, we can take a multi-pronged approach. Yes, we can increase the number of the judicial officers, okay? but. There is also what you, we call you public need, perception. You need to do everything possible for mm. us to have an expedi expeditious trial yes. of whoever suspect that is in the dock. Yes. So that then you will not have issues of bail or no bail. Yeah, I, I get your point. Once we have the necessary numbers of judicial officers, then the trials will be expeditious. Okay? But there is also 
public perception, the thinking that government is doing lip service to, uh, to justice, you understand? Mm -hmm. Someone is arrested today, tomorrow is released, and yet is alleged to have committed a heinous crime. So how do you deal with that perception? You understand? Let me, by the way, mm. most people think that mm. President Museveni proposed this the other day. President Museveni has been at this since, I think, remember 2014. Uh, I just want my producer to play a clip in 2014 when the president is addressing the issue of bail. He has been consistent. And uh, let's, see what he, let's hear what he said then. We are going to make sure that we restrain this bail constitutionally so that people who commit murder are, are not given bail except after six months, rape, defilement, we are even thinking of adding the sodomy. Okay, that's the president speaking in 2014. Yes, but People, you see what he was saying yes, but, but now, was already how, in the law. How do you even know hmm. that the suspect actually committed the offense? You see, what the president was saying then, he talks of six months, it was already embedded in the law. It was in this constitution which was made in 1995. So it's just coming to light for everyone to know that actually bail is not automatic if you have a, 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 a capital offense. Yes, because it, it is at the discretion of the judicial officer. And no one is to, tampering to with that, uh, that discretion. So what, what do you want to do if you are not uh, taking it away? We are not taking away the discretion of the judicial officer. And like you so, so if, if he continues, mm -hmm. now just wait a moment. Let mm -hmm. me let me let me bring you the president once again. Mm -hmm. Most recently, talking again about the issue of jail without bail. In no time, we are now being told that bail is a right. Right, really. Somebody has killed a person, and you, you you see him walking here. This is a provocation. I can tell you, life imprisonment. Oh, life imprisonment. But you killed the person. You are, you are not put in jail for life. You, the one you killed is not in jail. He is dead. So for us, it is an eye for an eye. Okay, the biblical days of, of the Old Testament, an eye for an eye. Mm. I can understand if somebody has killed, really. Mm. You know, somebody should be punished for that. Mm. If somebody has done a heinous crime, they should be punished for that. But, even but that, the problem is, the problem is, the problem is, and you should understand this better, court. Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, mm. because you're a politician. Mm. Back in Che Guevara, where you come from, mm. somebody can just actually put you a trumped up charge on you mm. when you're an innocent man. Mm. And then you are denied even the right to apply for bail. Mm. Would that be fair? We are, we are not taking away the right to apply for bail. Okay? We simply believe that the two should not be confused, the right to bail and the right to apply for bail. You see, the Constitution guarantees a presumption of innocence. In guaranteeing one a presumption of innocence, then that person should also have a right to apply but for now, bail. But now, what you are saying, it means that uh, you, everything you are doing, the status quo remains the same. Uh, you, what, see, what, will, see, what, you, is, what will you change in your proposition? You see, let me, tell, let, me, let me be clear. The constitution as it was made in 1995 yeah. was clear, saying any individual charged with a capital offense shall not be automatically released on bail unless that person has served 180 six. days. Six months. Six months, OK? That remained okay. And, 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 that, and that really is because you are gathering evidence, you're, you're trying to understand, you know, because it takes a time for somebody to prove a until, capital offense. Until a judgment of, a, I think, Justice Katusi, if I'm not mistaken, that said bail is now a right. You understand? In the case of the CJ. Since then, things changed. You understand? Meaning that the original mischief 
whatever had been intended to be cured by saying people should not automatically be granted bail. Yes, their presumption of innocence is respected. They have a right to apply for bail if they present exceptional circumstances. Court should have no reason not you, to grant them bail. Do you bail. know that there are circumstances innocent people have been jailed? Yes, I know. Do you know that it's unfair for you to jail an innocent person and yet criminals are out there? It happens. So don't you way. realize that when somebody has a right to apply for bail, mm. that would help somebody who has not committed a crime to I avoid going Patrick, in Patrick, I want to repeat. We are not taking away the right to apply for bail. That is what actually the Constitution states. If the judgment had not said that uh, bail is a right, the status quo in the Constitution would remain. You understand? Either one would have to spend six months on remand, or he would have to present exceptional circumstances. That is advanced age, or an ailment that is incapable of being managed. Those exceptional prison. circumstances are also uh, at the interpretation of the judicial officer, or no. they are spelled out. No, but uh, advanced age, yeah, that's one of them, yes. I'm saying that could be one of them. If I'm not mistaken, the judgment talked of either 55 years, they called that advanced age. Okay? But of course, the, the, the judicial officer also have to take into account, has to take into account the facts of the case, how gruesome that case is. The risk that once you go out, the mob will finish you. You understand? Considering the facts of the case, so you are on security. Uh, is as, one of the reasons why you as could a be, suspect, you could, you or or the fact that you were likely to tamper with the evidence and witnesses once you are out of prison. So, did you find a problem with leaving that at the discretion of the judge of the judges? That would not be a problem. I think you've not understood my point. It it was that way until court ruled that it was a right. You understand? What the was the right, what is a right that is embedded in the Constitution is the right to apply for bail. But look, I even, even if we use that case mm. where I think of Besuji, mm. this is a man in one year, he had been arrested I think if more than 40 times mm. and none, <laughs> none of the cases uh, put against him could stand in court. That judgment, I don't know, I think it was Katusi. I don't know, I don't remember the... That judgment said bail is a right. So, Altering so, 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 the so, position... So, so you're a lawyer. If, if there's a, a case in court mm. and they have given a judgment moving it a certain way, mm. does that change the supreme law of the land? One... Uh, it's used as a precedent for the lower courts upon which it binds. For the higher courts, it can be cited for persuasive reasons. You understand? So, that is the state of If it is still in our constitution, yes. which is the supreme law of the land, yes. doesn't that supersede Whatever comes Ideally there. Ideally speaking, that would be okay. But you see, there are methods by which laws are made. Okay? And uh, one of those methods is that judicial officers, through judgments, make laws by setting precedents which other which courts... Which can be quoted. Follow. Yes. So now, it appears mm. that because the prison started in 2014, Yes, he, ha he has not carried his the day on this particular issue. So uh, where are you at as the executive on this particular issue? If I understand your question mm -hmm. and I understand the president's assertions, the president, even if you replay that clip, he has not said you remove bail. Okay? We are going to maintain the right to apply for bail. 
we are going to maintain or to respect the judicial uh, system's exercise of its discretion. But we would rather would want to depart from the, the president. From the president. Okay? We would want to depart from the president. That is binding and the, or persuasive but and everything. I, I don't know, I don't know how the it. president hmm. even binds something that is already in the supreme law. That's where. Because. You see, the law grows, it okay? evolves. It evolves. No, I want to use the word grows. Mm -hmm. Uh, it grows by, you know, accepting certain changes that come along the way. Okay? That's why it must be flexible. So this came the way it did. And we are saying that its coming has opened a floodgate. By the way, if you do not know, if you go into the statistics of these criminal matters, they are bring, breeding a secondary uh, so, criminal wave. So in the case of BSJ... No, let me, let me mm. finish this. For every murder where an individual is released immediately, there is likely to be a mob justice. And there is also likely to be an accusation of corruption labeled against the judiciary. Let me tell you, and mob, yet mob, the justice, office, mob justice is happens, happens mm. because people have lost trust in the court system. Mob just happens ah, because the police... Mm. By the way, now, mob now you are getting where, to the point. Where I come from in, in now, Toro, there's, in, in Toro, there's mm. more mob justice in Toro, I suppose, mm. than anywhere else. I've seen that. Now, people we want to restore the respect of the judiciary by sticking to the law as it is. Judicial officers are not politicians. Judicial officers do not go uh, uh, to face the pressures in the villages where the mob justice emanates from. It's the politicians that are suffering with that. And the politicians are saying, let us be strict, enforce the law as it is. Mm -hmm. Perhaps it will reduce the mob justice, and also restore respect. Then people stop saying that the judge was paid for this. You understand? Judicial officers are not paid. They, do, they exercise their discretion as they wish, but then the public alleges corruption. So we are saying, if we stick to the law as it is, perhaps these allegations of corruption will come down. Perhaps it will come down, but mm. They may not, because uh, it's not guaranteed that that will fight corruption. Yeah, that is However, true. you as the mm. central, uh, as the executive, what you should have done mm. is to make sure that you have facilitated the judicial system. I have already told you about the recruitment exercise we are doing. Yeah, because, because uh, the Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, mm. that is talked about most of the time, but really uh, the problem is to implement what is a good uh, intent. Yeah, but you see, there is no law that is made with bad intentions, okay? And you see, even the best the law... Apartheid in South Africa was legal. Yeah. Was it a good... To, was to, it to a the good people law? who made it then... Yeah, it had a bad intention. That is your interpretation. You Honorable understand? Jackson Kafuzi, For us out apartheid here, had a bad intention. For us out here, we, or look, humanity. At it, that, we look at it that way. But the people who made that law, they had a, a mischief, whatever intention they had then. You understand? That was theirs, and it would be wrong for us. For something to be legal, to compare, it does, we can have something illegal, but not necessarily good. We can, it would be wrong for us to start comparing our laws to what happened in South Africa. No, no, just uh, because you say that every law is good, has, is well-intentioned, I'm just giving an yes, example. Yes, I'm saying it is well-intentioned. Um, no, and, and I it give is, you an example. It is, it is the that process. Apartheid was legal, but it was not good. Yeah, you see, I want, well I want to believe that it, the, the system abused it. Oh I my. do not think... Oh, my God. I don't think a, crafts, a drafts person sits and drafts this constitution and embeds clauses with bad intention. Okay? But you see, when it comes to interpretation, when it comes to putting into place 
whatever is embedded in the law. Everyone can give it its ro his own interpretation. And by so doing, abuse it in the process. Honorable Jackson, Kafuza, hold on to your point because we're going to take a break. When we come back, let's look into the proposed land laws that you're bringing before Parliament. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is the Deputy Attorney General, the Honorable Jackson Kafuzi. I just want to change gears now, look into something else. Uh, let's wait for the jail without bail. Let's wait for the consultation that is going There's on. There's no jail without bail. <laughs> <laughs> the jail without bail agenda. Uh, let's wait yeah, for the consultation. Yeah. And, and since in most cases, by the way, whenever there's a, cons a consultation, the president carries his day. So let's wait and see. You recently introduced a host of ideas that could determine the change in terms of fines uh, that people are finding in court and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, why are you suggesting these changes? If I know there are many. There are almost mm. about 60, 60, 68. 68 of mm. them. So mm. let's not get into the 68 of them, but the major ones, if you could. Uh, you see, when a law is made, mm -hmm. it is made for a, for a period. But then you'll find that a law is prescribing a particular fine. But with changes in the economy and whatnot. Inflation and all that. Yes, inflation and whatnot. After some time, these amounts envisaged in that law become literally useless. I want to make a reference to what people may, find, may, may know easily, the issue of adultery. Uh, the law used to talk of uh, a fine of 200 shillings. And uh, you, so at some point, that ceases being effective the fines embedded in or envisaged at that time, put in that law at that particular time, they may sound so big, well, if but may, after if some time. If for people to be caught in adultery, does that mean the two <laughs> are crime, are partners in crime? I don't want after to go there. I <laughs> used that as an example. I used that as an example. I want to give you an example here. Mm -hmm. um, We presented the 68 proposed yes. changes to fines. For example, you look at the Interpretation Act. Uh, Section 38 provides for a fine of 3,000 shillings. Okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, we are proposing to put that at 120,000. So at, uh, it, uh, we take a leap. So you just want to put a fine that can be bring a deterrent? It, yes. No, not necessarily a deterrent, but bring the law up to date. Yes, but at the end of the day, if there's a fine yes. that is heavy, mm. that means somebody will say, okay, I don't want to mess with this because... No, but now let me ask you, how would you feel if someone is charged with an offense and is asked to pay 3,000 shillings? Just as a lay person, how does it feel? And then no when he, when you go to pay no justice. Uh, exactly, and when you go to pay the three thousand shillings, you pay five thousand bank charges. You understand? Mm -hmm. It's a mockery. So uh, the intention is uh, to bring these laws up to date. Okay, mm -hmm. that's why we are proposing this these fines. N it's it's not deterrent in any way. Okay. So you want to make it deterrent? Yes. No, 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 no. It's, we, we don't want to make it deterrent. We simply think the fines that were proposed at the time can no longer match with the times in which we live. So we need to adjust them upwards. So when somebody puts a fine, mm. what is the intention of the fine? Uh, I do not want to believe that a, a fine is deterrent. Because, you see, when you are convicted, there's an option sometimes, either jail or a fine, okay? But you see, the intention of the law is not necessarily to, to, 
to punish, but rather to teach you. Correctional. To make, yeah, correction as you've put it. So asking someone to pay 3,000 shillings is not correction. I've heard the people who say, I can slap you and pay you. You understand? Because he knows that the law says, maybe for a slap you pay 3,000 shillings. So once you, because you see that law now is in the past. The fine was put in the, in the law long ago. Okay. So we are, we are updating it, bringing it up I just, speed. I just want to agree with you on that, that mm. makes sense. Mm. It makes sense because uh, the inflation, the economy, and, and maybe also mm. it could also help money coming back to the city. To, 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 to yeah, in the long the, run, in the long the run. State coffers, does, yeah. Yes, yeah. In the long run it does. But mm. also there are some proposition in the amendments for the land law? Uh, that's another area. I, you see, when the Land Act was made, it had been hoped that uh, the masses, the majority of the people who do not own titles, would be protected. It was intended if to give security of tenancy. Yes, would be protected but, but, but if... I, I don't understand, mm -hmm. because how do you give security of tenancy to somebody because he has lived on your land for 12 years and that gives him legitimacy to be there? You see, Patrick, the fact that someone lives on your land for 12 years, okay, it means you are not making use of that land you are an absentee landlord, then you should lay no claim to it. The person who is making uh, use of it should be given protection. Imagine there are people uh, you know, who have titles of land where they don't even, which they don't even know where yeah, it but is. Why should that cease hmm. to be their land because somebody settled on it for 10 years? Incidentally, years? it has not ceased to be their land. Because they are entitled to Usuru. Yeah, but, but you, in case you wanted to change this land, to mm -hmm. use it for, for any other thing, you just can't do it without so, the so, consent so, so Patrick, of, of the tenant. So, Patrick, do you think it's right for someone to live on this land for 12 years or even 20? And then you appear from nowhere and say, no, I have a title, I'm selling this land. As a government, shouldn't that person you know, be protected? When you look at our history, mm. our tumultuous history, mm. in 1986, when the NRM government came into power, mm. quite a number of people came from different parts of, of Uganda to come and settle in Buganda, for example. Mm. By the time they came, the areas of Ungoma, areas of Nakaseke, of Semamule, of Untusi, of Rugusuru, or whatever, mm. they were not as populated as they are today. Mm. So if people came from wherever and settled in the land of Buganda, Mm. And you make a law to say if they have lived there for 12 years, then that becomes their land. That would not be understood or accepted. But you know that the but law the applies Buganda. universally. This is not I'm about giving, Uganda. Uh, no, I'm, I'm giving an example because no, this no, is no, but where... But I think the example you're giving no, is wrong. This is, where, this is where we have seen mass migration. Don't we have titles in Toro? Listen, Don't we, we have, have seen mass in Toro? migration of people mm. who have come from el el elsewhere to live in Buganda. No, and, and, and in this case, mm. they have settled on land, or they came along and settled on land mm. that previously was being owned by other people. But when you Owned, but not used. Yes, true. Owned by other people, not used, yes. And now when you give them security of tenants on a land that was not theirs, then you know that you have created a problem. You see, land is an economic tool. And uh, it has a very big say in the growth of the economy. It's a fact of production. It is a fact of production, like you've said. If there is instability on land, people will not invest. And that instability bre breeds criminality. You understand? When the law was made, 
there had been a proposal to give people certificates of occupancy so that you know this person has lived on this piece of land for this position for this time and he has a certificate of occupancy so his tenure is recognized and protected it is a certificate of occupancy given on top of you who has the title because this person acknowledges that you have a title and gives you sulu but you see what has happened along the way that you see the people with the titles are not accepting usuru you understand they are not accepting usuru instead they are selling the land to other people this or attempting to evict the occupants of these lands so what do we do to protect them and these are the majority of ugandans apart from areas where there is no Myro land, okay? I want to tell you that about 10 years ago, we had about 400,000 titles. In a space of 10 years, the titles we have now are approaching 1 million. What does that tell you? That the speed by which people are demanding for land is too high. So unless we put into place certain mechanisms, land is going to be the next you, cause you, of war. Yeah, because the Uganda's land question has not been solved. Uh -huh. So what if we don't time. solve it? And, 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 and these things you're talking of, the security of occupancy, you know, certificate of occupancy, mm. security of tenancy on a land because you think it was redundant and somebody came and settled on it, yet somebody can say, look, this is our land for our grandfather and the other father and whatever. Mm. But and you did not use you it. Know, you, you, for me, not you utilize, never for me, not mm. utilize my piece of land does not make somebody who comes to settle on it, make it his. Patrick, let me give you an example. Let me use this uh, hypothetical case. You come from Fort Porto. Mm -hmm. I come from Chegegua. You find that you have a title for land in Chegegua. And you come to Chegegua and find that I have buried my six of my grandfathers on that land. Do you really think, do you really feel that you have the moral authority to own that land? Let us try to be realistic. Why not? The let, my latest grandfather died in 1964 and was buried on that land. And I want to assume his six other, eh? father and grandfathers, grand whatever, are on that land. And you come from Fort Porto and come to Chegegu and come with a title and say, this is my land. Yes, the law gives you that land because you have the title. But the same law ought to protect us, the people who are on this land. So because the we've been So the occupation. biggest problem is our land tenure system. Exactly. Exactly, and we, 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 we cannot even blame ourselves because we found ourselves in this. We cannot blame government, we cannot blame any Ugandan. We found ourselves in the middle of this. Because when the British came, they dished out land to those with whom they were allied. The Ugandans who owned the land woke up one day and found themselves labeled as squatters. That's why in 19, I think, 28, they had to make the Usul and the Vujo law, asking Ugandans to pay tithe to the people that had been given these titles. So if, uh, how about when you, to cure the problem is, mm. I have a substantial amount of Usul. Because some people may not take it, because mm -hmm. it's negligible. Yes, but uh, what would be substantial? I don't know. You have to agree or to reach a certain level. You see, maybe a certain because because uh, you see, it, it is also a class factor. The people who have titles are people who have some degree of class or some money on them, and the squatters are squatters. <laughs> yes, they are exactly that. So, how much do you want them to pay? 
to this rich man from Fort Porto. So then mm. why, why doesn't the government compensate them? Compensate who? The, the, the landlords. You see, that's why I was saying uh, we have no one to blame for this other than our colonial masters. Okay? It is not government that brought the squatter onto your land. But it's, Actually, you but will it's a government that is creating a law that will make it hard for you to repossess it. Yeah, but you see, the, you see, the government is under obligation to protect Ugandans, all Ugandans, not the landed ones against the unlanded ones. The intention is to protect everyone. We can have dialogue along the way, okay? But now we need to minimize the evictions. We need to minimize the extortion that is going on. You understand? And you know these things are happening. So we can have a law in place mm -hmm. as we, we continue to negotiate. As we continue, there are many other options available so ultimately, along the way. What is going to help us in solving our land question? Between you and I, if it were possible to go back to the colonial master who made this mistake and he pays reparations for the mistake he made. That won't happen, I suppose. Exactly. So if it won't happen, we are in this quagamaya together. Now, you who holds the title, we are asking you to respect the rights of fellow Ugandans who are on this, ta on this land. The Ugandans who are on this land are not as wealthy, as privileged as you are. So please accept the busuru that they are giving you. you. If your concern is the amount of busuru, that can be negotiated. But you do not ev evict whole villages. Okay? So I think what we need to do now mm -hmm. is put in, in effect our earlier proposal of giving people certificates of occupancy. You can call them blue titles, okay? So that uh, for my Chivanja, I have my blue title or a certificate of occupancy, and I can even mortgage it. I have rights, it confers rights upon me as an occupant. You cannot live like uh, the, 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 the Baganda say, okay, Sachimunge and Kokoyom Tamiv. You see, a, a drunkard who owns chicken, the, the chicken doesn't know when it will be killed. The next day you evicted because the rich man has Honorable, found an investor. Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, hold on to your point because we're going to take a break. When we come back, I just want to look into the violation of rights because every time we get a human rights report, we see agencies and security coming on top as the main violators of human rights. And the Attorney General's office has to, you know, stand in, if anything, maybe pay compensation, uh, compensation and we lose a lot of money through that. I'll also be opening the line so that you too, at home, wherever you are, you can be a part of this discussion. You see the numbers on the, on the screen. You can call us and talk to us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching On The Spot. My name is Patrick Amara. My guest tonight is Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, who is the Deputy Attorney General. And uh, in this segment of our discussion, you have, you have you are at liberty to call us and, and tell us what you think about the issues we've talked about. But also, in case you disagree with the Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, that's okay, but please or disagree. Or disagree with Patrick Kamara. Or me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not the star of the show. You are the one who is, because for us, we are here. We are here to hear from you. In case you disagree with me or Jackson, please, that's okay, but disagree with respect. So I'll be taking the callers as soon as possible as they come in. But before we do that, the country loses money through compensations when security operatives engage in violation of rights. And this is evidenced in the annual human rights report that we get. And I can imagine you, you are like the government uh, lawyer, so sometimes you are called in to defend some of the things that are not even defendable. What can we do to reduce on these violations? But also at the end of the day, the loss of public resources through compensations. Wow, you see, sometimes you wonder, you, when you see a law enforcer 
you know, going so hard on someone as if there's something personal, as if they have fought over something, and he, and yet ultimately, you also feel that Jackson. I'm a human being. Uh, criminal liability is individual. Okay, the people who do these things do them in their individual capacity. They do not do them as the representatives of government. Whether you are a soldier, or a police officer, or any member of government, you go out of your way to abuse an individual's right. You are doing that in your individual capacity. The only problem is that you are wearing a government uh, image. So they associate you with government. You understand? It's nowhere in the laws of government uh, stated that uh, a soldier should go and beat people. It is not. Or a police officer should go and uh, humiliate others. So you where understand? have we seen time and again you stepping in to pay for their crimes? Yeah. Uh, the law is yet such it is that... The criminal liabilities for an individual. The law is such that if this person violates an individual's rights, while in the well, in line of duty. his line of duty, then the government picks the check vicariously. But lately we have adjusted the law. We put in place a law called the Human Rights Enforcement Act. Uh, while Article 57, if I'm not mistaken, says any person who believes his rights have been violated can sue government for compensation. That's where now the Attorney General comes in. But with the Human Rights Enforcement Act, what we are saying is that it should be the offending institution to which you belong that should pay this money. Its budget gets affected, and then it will clamp hard on people Individual. who behave like you. You understand? If a soldier goes to a market and misbehaves, Yes, the Attorney General will go to court, but ultimately it would be the Ministry of Defense budget to be affected. You understand? It will be internal affairs, police. And in that case, the ministry will uh, have to rain on their errant officers. Exactly. Exactly. How about going for a personal liability so that they can individually pay. Incidentally, under that law, the Human Rights Enforcement Act, you sue that individual plus the Attorney General or government. But you see, in legal uh, parlance, we have what we call the deeper pocket theory. People go for one with more money. Because uh, a police officer of, of Uganda police, the may, police not officer have may not have enough to compensate you. Yes. So you, you you take out your order and have it enforced as against government. You know, there are things that have been done, and, and you see, mm -hmm. you're a member of the executive, that have been done by our, our security agencies, especially the arrest of people. And you see, like, the arrest of members of parliament, in handling them in a dangerous manner, as if they're, you know, uh, terrorists, you know, and taking them to gazetted places of detention, you know, where their lawyers and their family cannot r meet them. Really? In the 21st century? Patrick. With such, a, with such a beautiful constitution? Patrick, I want to condemn any form of disrespect and abuse of human rights of all individuals, including my colleagues in parliament. Uh, the speak of parliament is on record on this. You do not arrest members of parliament without going through the office of the speaker. Uh, now, whatever happened, happened. Let us wait and see the next step. As a uh, uh, deputy attorney general, I cannot go beyond that. Otherwise, I will be condemning my own office into paying damages. Okay? Yeah. So. You know, we have seen vehicles that have since been named, uh, you know, you know, drones, nicknamed drones, mm. which are used, I can actually say, to abduct Ugandans because abduction is what they do. Mm. 
and the, the things they do are despicable. Mm. Do they? You are a member of parliament, you represent people, but you also are out on a general day, Ugandan. Mm. I mean, and yet it is possible to, for some of these people to tell them, you know what, we need you at court. Mm. Or know what you are under arrest. Or even to go with a police vehicle that can be identified. Yeah, yeah take them. So mm. why, why do we have such you things? See, you see, you see, the law says if you are going to arrest someone, one, identify yourself. Two, tell him the reason as to why he's being arrested. Three, give him an opportunity to inform his relatives or next of kin that he's being arrested and he's in such and such May I say that, that being an attorney general in times like this must be a hard job? You see, I Because like you I are said, stating what should be, but that's not happening. And yet you are going to come and defend. There, there, are, the, the there are some rogue elements within, but that does not make everybody rogue. Maybe there are some good, that does not some make, good officers and many rogue That elements. does not make the intentions of government rogue. You understand? And that's why time and again, these matters go to court, and sometimes they are dismissed. I just want to open the lines uh, 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 so that, uh, so that yes. <laughs> because right we've now, been having people who are trying to ask you In the criminal justice system, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you present evidence of torture, ideally speaking, your case can collapse. The courts have taken judicial notice of that. If you go to court and show that I've been tortured for ABCD, okay, because it is cruel, inhuman, and condemned, it's not allowed in the Constitution, in the law. So once court takes judicial notice of that, it is proved, your case should collapse. So these rogue elements who are doing this, all they need is uh, to be taken for further training, especially in as far as respect for human rights is concerned. Um, I want to open the line so that you too can be a part of this discussion. You're going to see the numbers on the screen. Uh, pick up your phone and call us and tell us what you think. We have looked through the issue of jail without bail. We have looked through the issue of the offenses and the fines that uh, they want to reintroduce. Let me take a call online. Hello. Hello. I have somebody online. Hello. Okay. As we Hello. Okay. Hello. 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 Yes, unfortunately I can't hear you. Your voice is very fainty right here. So I'm 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 likely to drop that line and then I'll pick another. So, so, so moving, moving forward, um, the, the issue of, uh, of uh, okay, the land you said it's, it maybe that will, we shall need maybe a total, maybe overhaul of our land tenure system, or perhaps if we don't, moving forward as a country, we may find ourselves in, in bigger problems because the, the land issue is going to be there. And on the issue of the bail without jail, you are out in the field trying to consult. Yes. I wonder how the consultation is going, what the people of Uganda are telling you. The process is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. We are consulting. There are mixed feelings, mm -hmm. but it takes some explaining to do. Uh, let us see what happens ultimately. Okay. Mm. My producer is telling me there are some technical hitches we're getting there. And uh, for some of you who would want, let me try to take one more. Hello? Hello? All right. We have an issue with that line, unfortunately, and our time is out. Honorable Jackson Kafuzi, what's going to be your concluding remark tonight? Uh, I would want to implore Ugandans who are watching this program. Mm -hmm. The issue of bail should not be misunderstood. The intention is not to, to take away the right to apply for bail. But the intention is that uh, uh, the grant of bail should not be abused. We do acknowledge that uh, courts have been understaffed. As a result, we have embarked on uh, some rigorous uh, recruitment exercise so that we have enough judges. Yes. So that uh, we are sure that uh, 
uh, people will not stay longer on remand. They can, the matters can expeditiously be attended to. Then there will be no need for people to apply for bail. All right. Mm. Honorable Jackson Kafuze, I want to thank you so much for your time. But most importantly, I want to thank you for your insights. And for those of you who have been watching this program, I want to thank you for your great company. Good night, and God bless Uganda.